Well, brothers and sisters, we are going to take a hiatus from our study in the Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, pardon me. Uh, we are going to be looking quite possibly at a large number of scriptures, uh, but a theme throughout this time will be uh, studies in First Peter and preaching uh, this book. Uh, we're looking at uh, the salutation, the opening greeting of Peter's first letter. First Peter chapter one, verses one and two. And um, almost there. Jesus Christ, to the refugees scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification by the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. As Peter writes this letter, there is a season of great terror that is throughout the Roman Empire. Nero was the emperor. And just saying that name, no one says, Nero who? Which Nero are we talking about? No, everyone knows who Nero is. Everyone knows the stories. Everyone knows the history. Now, right down to the burning of Rome, the blaming of Christians, and subsequent burning of them. Horrible persecution. Peter himself was killed under Nero's regime and uh, was crucified upside down, finding himself unworthy to be crucified the way uh, our Lord was. Uh, William Grudem, in his commentary on this book, says several subjects occur quite frequently in this short letter. Now, now listen to these subjects as they're summarized by, by Dr. Grudem, such as holiness of life, the sufferings of Christ, suffering as a Christian, God's sovereignty in salvation and life, the God, the work of the Holy Spirit, the church as the new people of God, the reality of the unseen spiritual world, and trusting in God regarding daily circumstances. I hadn't read this summary uh, when I decided to uh, start looking at I, I want to look at First Peter with you. Because each of those things are so needed and so vital in the days that we are facing as a church, as a state, as a nation, indeed as nations around the world. Just that last one, trusting in God regarding daily circumstances. Our daily circumstances have changed. Uh, having grown up in a nation where, uh, now some of you remember gas lines and, and some rationing in, in times past, but for the vast majority of the time, if you need paper towels, you go to the store and you buy paper towels. And if, and if there's not any there, you say, well, when are they going to come in? And they know exactly when they'll come in. You know, you can come in that day and get them. If you need meat, you go to the store and you buy meat. Not so this week. Not so in our land at this point. Our daily circumstances have changed. We want to encourage one another in trusting God and knowing and our submission to him. Well, as we begin looking at this book, firstly, we ask, who is writing? And it's, it's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter, that name given to him by our Lord. Mark says it best in his gospel in, in Mark 3.16. 
Simon, whom he named Peter. The Lord wanted to make a point in a name that he had given. Often we have nicknames uh, for one another. We have pet names for our spouse or our kids or friends that we've known our whole life. We have those nicknames that come about and, and stick with them. But here Christ very intentionally uh, was naming Simon Peter. And in Matthew 16, 18, we read, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that's not a profession of, of Peter as uh, the first pope or anything like that. Peter is the one who preached that first uh, New Testament uh, church sermon on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people uh, were added to the church that day and it began to grow like wildfire. And Peter was an apostle. He was one part of that initial team of men appointed by uh, the voice of Christ to go and to establish uh, his church and establish the mission of the church. And so Peter then was given that, that office of apostle was given to him by our Lord as well. And we read in Ephesians 4, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. Well, why? Why and how long? Until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a complete man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we may no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men, by craftiness, with deceitful scheming. And we can learn something about ourselves in that passage. Why do we need these offices that were established throughout time? Uh, to build up the church? Well, because we aren't built up. We are weak. Now, we are not mature. We need to come into the unity of the faith, into a complete, into a mature man. Mature man. We, we are naturally scattered. We need drawn together in unity. We're immature. We're like children. We're tossed to and fro, and we are tossed about as we hear uh, this teaching and that idea and that proposed doctrine and that that broadcast etc cetera, etc cetera. we're we're blown about we need built up we need strengthened we need unified we need matured and god gave us these offices in various seasons of the life of the church to accomplish those very things in us and peter was one of those. He was an apostle. In fact, he was uh, considered the apostle to the circumcision. He was considered uh, the one who would be reaching out and building up the church from within the uh, the saints, uh, the Jewish the Jewish folks. What else do we know about Peter? We know that. He was one who knew what it was to fear and be tempted to sin himself. We read this in Matthew 26, a very horrific moment in Peter's life. Christ had even told him, this must be a joke. No, Lord, I never, I would, I would go to the death for you. And he ultimately did. But in the meantime, he had this moment where he flat out denies, swearing up and down. He doesn't know the, know the man, making a big deal out of it. Now, when we read this, this section in the Gospel of Luke, it becomes all the more painful. Perhaps you've had that moment where you're talking about someone and then realize they're standing behind you. They've walked in the room. And you're talking about what a horrible boss they are, what a terrible friend they are. Um, And then the room gets eerily quiet. And you know you've been had. In the Gospel of Luke, when, when Peter denies Christ that third time, we realize that Christ and Peter 
were within eyeshot of one another. And when Peter denies him, he, he already knows that guilt in his heart. And he looks up and Christ looks up in their lock eyes across from Peter knew. A fake trial, guilty until proven innocent. Peter didn't want to be swept up in that. He had that valiant moment where he lops off the ear of the guy, the, the, the servant of the, of the priest. And yet he quickly retreats into the darkness, afraid. And he sinned because of that fear. But Peter was also one who knew what it was to be restored and to go on serving the master even unto death as he had claimed that he would. We read about this in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, through the water to the beach. And Christ and Peter have this moment where, where the Lord restores him. Now, where the Lord takes him out of that place of fear and brokenness and sinfulness. And he doesn't necessarily make it easy. He asks three times. He doesn't say, do you love me? Yeah, okay, we're good. Everything's fine. No, he, he goes through what is needed to Peter, that Peter loved him. And to remind him of all the good things that Christ had done in him. So that's who's writing to us in this letter. To whom is he writing? Now, this is where the, the Greek help, helps us out a little bit. Uh, in our American translations, uh, the word elect shows up in uh, the second verse, but in, in, in the Greek, it's up through that, the, the refugees scattered, and there's various phrases for that, dispersed, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He's he's writing to elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, some people bristle at that word election at, at being elect. Now, but in our church, we use what's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and there's it's a series of questions and answers that present summaries of biblical teaching. And it asks, did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? And uh, Trinity family, you know I love this answer. Um, we may be having some technical difficulties. It says somebody's saying the stream is frozen, so we'll carry on as best we can. And uh, if it doesn't unfreeze, we'll download the video and get it up to Sermon Audio and let you know. Okay? So I will keep preaching. Uh, the, the question comes, um, did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? It says, God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life and to bring them in, into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. Out of his mere good pleasure, God elected some. You read in Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Why has he done that? Because he chose us in Christ. Chose us in Christ. Now part of the challenge of this verse is that this election seems to be wrapped up not only in salvation, but also in suffering. They are elect exiles. They're scattered abroad in these cities listed here throughout Asia Minor. Uh, perhaps Jews scattered from uh, Babylon in persecution and dispersion. These are the ones to whom 
he is writing, and he is writing to us. He is writing to us, and we, are we not at this point dispersed? We are not the church gathered. We are the church scattered. And so we're uh, forced to turn to alternate means, only be saved, but also to suffer this moment in human history. And, and there are some who want to uh, say it's, it's not as bad as they say, and some say they're not telling us how bad it is. It's going to be ultimately severely worse, probably somewhere in between. But this is these are very uncertain days. We do not know exactly the extent of the suffering that will come in our nation and in other nations. And so we see very quickly how this applies to us. As we're scattered throughout Burtonsville and and we are scattered. And even as we suffer, we can have confidence being the elect of God. We'll talk about this more in a little bit, and, and hopefully it'll be clear that that's not a statement of pride, fleshly pride on our parts. But we'll explore that a little bit more. Why is he writing? Well, he's writing, we find in this, apostolic greeting, similar to the greeting that I gave you uh, at the beginning of our time together here that I give you in public worship each week. Grace our lives when we lack peace and we need peace to be multiplied to us. That seeming day to day, uh, maybe we feel like it doesn't quite cut it. And Peter is writing and he is declaring a grace and a peace that is multiplied to us. But how? Is he bringing this grace and peace? He's not just, he's not giving this short shrift. He's not just quickly taking some glancing blows. He's presenting in this greeting, in this salutation, he is presenting core ideas that he will spend the rest of the book unpacking and showing off these glorious gifts of God in our salvation. How is he bringing this grace and peace? By reminding his readers of the sovereign world. Why are they suffering? They are suffering because of the actions of humanity that were at that time in governmental roles. But friends, God is not just in charge of me or you. He's in charge of all the small and the great. And Peter is reminding us of that very truth. He's reminding them of God's saving of his people. And he does so by reminding them of this great truth of God's foreknowledge. According, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, is this a simple prescience that he knew beforehand? Did God just know that you would be saved? And Matthew Henry's commentary is right to point out that, that this is true because God and God alone sees all things at once. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what to us was, what is, and what will be. So yes, in that way, God knew beforehand. But while true, that is also an insufficient understanding of God's foreknowledge. We see elsewhere in Scripture that God's foreknowledge is not some passive result. In in Matthew Henry's commentary, it's mentioned uh, it speaks of the mathematician who knows beforehand, he has foreknowledge that an eclipse will happen. How does he know? Well, because he's run the numbers. He is passive in his knowledge because to him, the eclipse is foretold to him by the math. But brothers and sisters, God is not passive. God is active. He is the doer. He is the cause. God's 
foreknew, he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we will look at the fuller context of this in a little bit to glean greater comfort from it. But suffice it to say that God's foreknowing us, his loving us beforehand, as we overlay the biblical sense of knowing someone, leads him to act in specific ways towards us to guarantee, to accomplish, to cause the goal of his. And you're right. It is unfair. It's unfair because every single one of us, every person walking the earth right now in all of their dignity, in all of their sanctity, in all of their bearing of the image of God upon them, was born into utter rebellion against God. You're absolutely right. God's foreknowledge, his election of some, which is a bigger number than just a handful, his election of some is unfair because since we all have rebelled against God, we all have lost our communion with him, are under his wrath and curse, are being made liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. We all deserve that. That is fair. Praise God for the unfairness of his electing love, his wondrous foreknowledge. Because without it, I would be headed to hell. And so how does the Lord enact these things? By sanctifying them through the Holy Spirit, through sanctification by the Spirit, Spe sending the Holy Spirit to call us, to justify us, sanctify us, then eventually glorify us as he applies to us the person and work of Jesus Christ. Also, um, through sanctification by the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. The sprinkling them with the blood of Jesus is, is a throwback, a head nod, tip of the hat, if you will, to the Old Testament sacrifices where the blood, yes, it was shed, but it was also sprinkled to purify. Christ's blood not only saves it also sanctifies as the Holy Spirit applies his person and work to us, cleansing us by the blood of Jesus. So fourthly, how is this writing to be a comfort to us? How do we, how do we posture ourselves to take comfort from 1 Peter well, we see clearly God's control over our circumstances. We understand that suffering, isolation, even loss are indicators of God's love for his repentant children because he does not keep us from pain, but he keeps us through pain. So therefore, the sufferings of this life begin to come into focus, not as hindrances to our walk with Christ, but catalysts for it. A couple longer passages here I want to turn to. Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And so we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also boast in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces patience. 
Patience produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. While we were yet weak, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Rarely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, being now justified by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath through him? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled for our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In all of this great complex of salvation, this reconciliation that we receive, we understand that Christ died for us. The salvation is a message of the suffering of the Lord. And we see that suffering produces patience. Tribulation produces patience, which leads us all through to hope that does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been shown abroad in our dark hearts by the Holy Spirit. We also gain comfort as we look at the whole context of Romans 8. This is a little bit longer passage. Romans 8, verses 12 through 31, which says, Therefore, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, again, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children are with him, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. The eager expectation of the creation waits for the appearance of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but by the will of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan within ourselves while eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we are. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? And then... uh, In the balance of that chapter, we read, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yes, who has risen, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us? From the love of God, so tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor neither angels, nor principalities, nor powers, neither things present nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, when we face these trials, when we face tribulation and peril and distress and famine and nakedness and sword, when we face these things, we are tempted to think God has abandoned us. He's forsaken us. He's gone from us. Where is our hope? But brothers and sisters, in that moment, in that time, God is proving his love for us because the very things that we think separate God's love for us, he is crying to us through them, I love you. And I'm just saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. We need to take comfort in that. And finally, we take comfort in knowing that we are not the first to be elect exiles dispersed abroad. I'm talking about that ultimate elect exile dispersed abroad, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, we read, let this mind, but he emptied himself taking upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Sisters, Christ, God the Son, was chosen by the Father. He, he, freely, he freely entered in to that covenant of redemption. And he came. He was dispersed abroad, far from home, far from his heavenly throne. And he came and he laid down his life. He suffered. He bled. He died. After having lived a perfect life, he died the perfect death. He took our penalty. And he gave us his righteousness. And now we are saved. In Acts 2, we, we catch another glimpse of this when Peter is preaching and, he, and he's speaking to the Jews and he says, you have taken him who was handed over to you by the ordained counsel and foreknowledge of God and by lawless hands have crucified and killed him whom God raised up by loosening the pull of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. The foreknowledge of God sent Christ to suffer and die for our sins. Because we live in a sinful world, we too will suffer. It is not beyond reason to think that some of you listening right now may die in this event. But our hope is in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Though he slay us, yet shall we praise him. And friends, if he does slay us, how much better it is to exchange this life for the life to come. Let us take comfort as elect exiles in dispersion that we have a savior who was an elect exile, who was dispersed abroad to save sinners like you and like me. Let us turn to him in prayer. Father, comfort your people in this hour. May they see these, these large passages of scripture that lay out your love for your people in the midst of suffering. In the midst of death, in the midst of isolation, these things do not separate us from you. But they bear out your love for us. Help us, Lord, to turn constantly to your word. To know it, to love it to apply it. We pray 
in Christ's name. And let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.